On Screen Manitoba is an innovative membership-driven association that leads, builds, and represents the Manitoba screen-based industry. And uh, now I'll invite Daniel Cross to um, introduce our panelists and uh, take us through this, what promises to be a very interesting morning. Okay, hi, good morning. Uh, what we got here is the uh, expanding the producer's tool bag, blending traditional financing with emerging opportunities on digital platforms. So I uh, want and would uh, really appreciate if Anyone in the audience, after we've gone through the panelists, have any leads on new ideas or new opportunities to bring them up and throw them out there? Because obviously, w we, we don't have all the uh, emerging opportunities. Uh, but let me in introduce the panelists. This is Stephanie MacArthur from Hot Docs, and Lawrence Dennis from the Royal Bank, and at the end, Avi Fettergreen from his company, Avi Fettergreen. And we're going to go in this order. Really and they can <laughs> introduce themselves a little bit more in detail and give you some opportunities for uh, emerging platform, uh, uh, emerging opportunities on digital platforms. Stephanie? Hi, good morning, everyone. Um, so at Hot Docs, what I do is I'm the foreman ma market manager, which means that I oversee a lot of our industry programming that we have. And so I'm just going to talk to you about a couple of the things we have going on. Um, the first of which actually isn't a new opportunity. It's something we've had for a couple of years, but I just want to make sure that everyone in the room knows about it. Uh, we have a fund that's called the um, Shaw Media Hot Docs Fund, and that's a fund that's open to Canadian filmmakers who are making documentary films. And we have two categories for the fund. There's a development category, which is a no-interest loan, um, and that's repayable upon start of production or the completion of your financing. And then we also have a completion fund, which is gap financing. So when you've got your, your financing almost completed and you've got a little bit left that you need, you can apply to the completion fund for that. So again, that's open to Canadian producers doing documentaries. We get very, very few applications from producers in Manitoba, and we'd really like to see those numbers go up. So if you think that your project might be applicable, you can talk to me later, or you can check out our website to look into that, because it's a really great opportunity. Can you just, uh, what is like one of the big uh, 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 qualification requirements? Um, there's not as many qualification requirements for the development uh, fund, because it is for projects that are just starting out. If it's you're applying to the completion fund, you do need to have um, a Canadian broadcaster on board. Um, so that's kind of the main uh, stumbling block for that completion is to have that on board already. If you had a theatrical distributor that was recognized, would that replace a broadcaster or no, not in this case? I think it can be counted in certain cases, but, uh, but that's the eligibility for that is left up to the, the committee. So. <laughs> um, and just to give you an idea of the, the scope of that fund, we have uh, $4 million to give out. Um, over seven years, and we've, to this point, only given out two million. So we've got two million more to give. Um, so far, we've given about 500,000 to the development and about 1,500,000 to the completion, just to give you an idea of, of where that money is falling. The completion fund's a grant, so you don't need to repay that at all. Yeah. Woohoo. We like grants. Yeah, and the, I mean, the idea with the development fund of it being a, a loan is so that that money gets poured back into the fund and that hopefully we can keep giving those uh, development loans for a longer period of time. Um, so the next thing that I, I wanted to talk about is crowdfunding, um, which I know that is kind of a big buzzword that's going on these days. Hot Docs has jumped in feet first to join the trend. Um, we have our own crowdfunding initiative called Doc Ignite. So it's a brand new thing that we've started um, this year. We've so far only run three campaigns, the, the last of which actually closed last night at midnight. Um, <clears throat> so we've, we've had these three campaigns. And I don't know if there's anyone in the room that doesn't really know what crowdfunding is, uh, but I'll give a really brief summary. The way that it works with this model, there's a couple of different models, but the way that, that it works with this model and the most common model is that you're sourcing funds from a crowd and you're not giving up any ownership of your film to them. You're not giving up any equity. Um, you're not giving up creative control. And it's, n it's not a donation either. You're not giving tax receipts, because in most cases, you're not eligible to give tax receipts as a filmmaker. 
what you are doing is giving an incentive in exchange for the money. So it might be that they get a copy of the DVD when it comes out. It might be that they get posters, signed posters of the film. It might be, you know, there's a whole array of, of things, but they get an incentive that is equal value. And this, this will become important later when we talk about tax credits. Um, <clears throat> it, that is an equal value to the amount of money that they've given you. And you take that money and you can put it towards your project. There's a couple of really well-known sites, um, Kickstarter being the biggest, uh, which is an American site. Unfortunately, that makes it close to a lot of Canadians. The Kickstarter rules are pretty tight. You have to have either um, an American, you have to have an American bank account and an American address. So if you don't have someone in the States that you can partner with to make that happen, it can be very difficult. Uh, there's also Indiegogo, which is kind of the second biggest one after Kickstarter. It's a little bit easier for Canadians to use Indiegogo. Um, but when you are, if you are using one that collects funds in American dollars, the other thing to take into account is the amount of money that you'll lose in the conversion because you're converting it back to Canadian money. Um, with Doc Ignite, it's all in Canadian funds. It's only open to documentary filmmakers, um, and, can and it's specifically for Canadian projects. So it's something that uh, if you're interested in being part of, you can also talk to me about or check out our website for the, the application form for that. Can you just uh, give an, ex an example of one of the projects and yeah. just how it arced. Sure. And you had some also some good advice about how to uh, run one of these campaigns. Yeah, so our, our first project that we did was called How to Build a Time Machine. And uh, they ended up raising $25,000, actually just over $25,000. They raised about $500 above their goal, which was $25,000. Um, and How to Build a Time Machine was kind of a perfect example of how to do this kind of thing. The filmmaker was Jay Shiel. And he did a film last year called Beauty Day, which uh, screened at Hot Docs, was screened at another of other festivals, and was a kind of a, a fanboy hit. Um, the kind of audience who really liked Beauty Boy is the kind of audience that becomes a fan of a filmmaker, becomes a fan of a genre, and is really excited and, and really interested in getting behind them at early stages. They're the people who talk about films all the way through their development, that post on websites, that share information. It's the perfect kind of audience to monetize because they're so invested. Um, Jay himself already had an ongoing relationship with his audience, and I think this is really key. I think if you haven't already engaged your audience at all, then it's too early to start a crowdfunding campaign. Um, you can't, it's like a relationship. It's like if you, you know, you meet someone uh, on the street and you introduce yourself and the first thing you ask them is, will you marry me? You have to work up to that. You have to start building your relationship and you can't, can't start asking people for money until you get to that point. Um, so what Jay had done is he had a, an ongoing blog that he was working on, and he had a really good audience for that. And then he started posting many videos on his blog, and he charged 99 cents to watch these videos, and people were paying 99 cents to watch them. So he'd already monetized his audience. He'd already gotten them used to the idea of giving a little bit of money to his campaign, or to his projects. Um, so we had some really good things going for us uh, just with the filmmaker. And then the subject matter of the film was another perfect example because the film was How to Build a Time Machine. It is a film about time travel. Um, and so again, it's that kind of subject matter that can really galvanize an audience. And it doesn't have to be you know, fanboy type material. It can be anything. It can be something that speaks to a specific community, that speaks to a specific issue. Um, but it's really important to know who your audience is for those films, to source them out, and to start actively engaging with them before you start asking them for money. Um, I'm just going to give you a couple of numbers to give you an idea because one of the things uh, that, that's interesting to note with crowdfunding is it, it goes in this kind of U and it's a very scary thing, crowdfunding, because most people, you know, they might start out strong, but then there's this lull in, this, in the middle. There's this horrible little period where no one is giving you money and you're working really hard and you're slogging and you're getting it out there and you're not seeing anything. Um, and then it always comes back up. And we just saw it again yesterday with our campaign that closed at midnight. Um, on Monday, they only had 107 contributors to their campaign. And by the end of the day, last night, they had 157 contributors. So they got about a third of their contributors in the final three days of their campaign. And that's, that's pretty common. So just to give you some numbers from Time Machine, over the total of their campaign, which was a 45-day campaign, they had 380 contributors. Um, of those contributors, uh, they got just over 100 in the first two days, and they got just over 100 in the last three days. So you're really seeing this kind of inverted U where you're spiking at the beginning, and then it's slowing down. And in fact, 
the week in the middle, in the, uh, in the day 21 through 28, they only had 12 contributors in that one week. So there really was a, a low point where it slowed down. So my, one of my pieces of advice is, if you're doing crowdfunding, don't panic, don't abandon your campaign, keep pushing through, uh, because you're gonna see a big push at the end. The other thing is that um, because of that, it's really better to go for shorter campaigns rather than longer ones. You might think a longer campaign is better because you can get the word out more, there's more time for people to give, but the time limit really encourages people to, um, to give as quickly as possible. It really encourages them to pull out their wallet to give now. Um, and so I, I actually consider kind of the 30 day to 40 day range the, the optimal time period for that. Can you, can you create like fake endings? So you can get like a spike and then go, oops, sorry, I made a mistake. It's actually another, I got the wrong week. It's next week and then have another another fake ending. Well, I mean, you, you could accept that. One of the most important things I think with crowdfunding is if you're only looking at it as a way to get money, then you're, you're doing it wrong. Um, because oh, honesty. because one of the most important things one of the most important things that comes out of crowdfunding is audience engagement. It's audience building. It's the fact that you know now there's 380 people who feel like they own a little piece of this film, who are excited for this film, who are going to tell their friends about it when it comes out, who are going to go and see it. Um, and so he's built a wide network of audience. And if you start betraying that trust. You know, if you tell people this is the deadline and they and they send it out to their social networks and they get everyone excited and they say, you know, you really have to give tonight at midnight is the deadline, give now, and then it's not the deadline, they feel a little betrayed. And the same is with the comes in with the incentives. Bad idea. Where well, where I think, you know, one of the things that happens with crowdfunding is you're giving an incentive. You're giving them something in exchange. And so it's also really important that you follow up with those incentives. It's important that you follow up with personal thank yous because one of the biggest aspects of this is the audience engagement, the relationship building, which will continue not just in this project, but if you've done it right, will continue through all of the rest of your projects. Um, and so you really need to keep that, those relationships alive. And it, it can be difficult to manage because now there are 380 people who, you know, and, and sometimes think that they owe, that they, they're owed explanations the same way that your large scale funders are. So it's a little bit of people management, but it can be really, really useful. Okay, cool. We're gonna yeah. we're, we'll come back. Obviously, there'll be a lot of talk about that. Um, we're gonna watch a clip before we go to uh, uh, Lawrence. Um, this is a case study of a film, uh, Trials and Tribulations, uh, with some uh, interviews with the producers, uh, etc. So we're gonna go with clip one. Oh, moving that train. The hope is that that train stays moving. Um, because you build momentum, you spend money, and the minute you stop, that money might just be... Budapest, uh, it ended up not working out. We have maybe one month of reworking on the script. We go in Berlin to work a little bit with them, and after we come back in France, and we made the exchange between Berlin, Paris, and LA with Ross on the script to arrive to a version at the end of uh, October. Time went by, we started spending more money, and we had convinced everyone that the UK was the best alternative. Meanwhile, in the background, Ross had been exploring this option in Manitoba. I was approached by a group from Winnipeg about their new tax credit and shooting there and the advantages of shooting there. And so I, I sent them the script. They loved it. They flipped out for Xavier's work. The, the people at Manitoba Film and Music, which is the local film commission, they offered us to they offered to invest in the film we started doing more research and as darren in europe was working on kind of the european options i was working on this option in winnipeg so we had one formal commitment in place for a big piece of money that came together over the course of afm so in that suspenseful moment of big money and lots of confusion and multiple countries and co-productions i introduce you to lawrence Thanks. Um, again, I'm Lawrence Dennis. I'm from uh, RBC. I am part of a specialized group within the bank that deals with uh, financing film. Um, we help producers access tax credits early and we bridge that part in the production and uh, allow them uh, some, I would say, flexibility in getting their project completed without having to wait for the government to show up with funds. So uh, the swear words earlier about uh, interest-free and and grants and, uh, and no fees, but uh, RBC has been involved in that for going on 20 years now, so we have quite a high level of expertise in our organization um, around the accessing of these 
tax credits and the rules and regulations around them. So um, I don't have any exciting news to talk about, like uh, crowdsourcing or anything. I just know I have a company with deep pockets that would love to support your uh, your ventures. So I'll open it up if there's questions or if you have. Well, okay. Question. When you, say deep pockets. <laughs> <laughs> you must deal with us, right? <laughs> Yeah, say take a shot at a banker moment, right? No, 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 I was just looking actually about debt financing. Oh. Debt financers at the highest level, so that's what we do. Uh, e equity is not our game. We we don't finance company equity ever, let alone project equity. So. But you only finance when you like approach funds and like grant opportunities. Right, that's something, and and that's something we do across the country and it, to give back into the industry is to provide those types of uh, awards or grants um, to emerging filmmakers. I mean, we're in this industry to, to support it and, and win with you, so why wouldn't we? The answer was forever. Could you just maybe start a little more at the beginning, just for people who are just like basically like approaching the bank? What what does this financing mean? What 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 you know? What uh, confirms that you can actually consider the, it as eligible, and then how to close it? Sure. Uh, I mean, the main point of eligibility for us is always that you do have a fully funded project. You have signed uh, contracts from um, or licensing agreements with confirmed good third parties and what we do then is look at your cash flow requirements over the term of the project and instead of uh, waiting for provincial or federal tax credits to uh, come in after the production is complete we allow you to access those provincial and federal tax credits immediately at the beginning so you can work them into your cash flow right away um, the word gap is a swear word in our business so when we say fully funded we do mean fully funded uh, with gap we, we we will not finance a project that has a shortfall um, in the funding model Lawrence if, if there was a thirty thousand uh, dollar crowdsourcing financing plan in the future would that just for you would that just be a gap or would you pack it up you would suggest, just, just so I'm clear, you've begun the project, there's a gap within the project, you're going to get that money through yeah, a crowdsourcing ongoing, facility. Maybe we can't afford to wait for, you know, and we're it's trying to close and it's inter uh, halfway it, it, there. Right. And, it, and that's a really interesting question because um, the financial institution known as Royal Bank has yet to understand the ramifications of such funding models. Um, they work hard to try to stay ahead of the yield curve, but you're absolutely right if there is a crowdsourcing model. Uh, it's sort of new to, to the business, and what that, without that sort of track record of understanding how it's going to work, it's very difficult for risk managers to look at it and say, that's a guaranteed uh, you know, fill of the gap. So as, as these projects are being created and made and using that model as they get more and more successful, if it's a track record that that is an acceptable way to finance a production, then the bank would fully support it. Um, but until that it's track okay. record shows up, I mean, it's a it's a difficult place to for for a risk manager to be. Don't yell at me. No, I was. Do, do you want to, do you want to know what the the kind of current numbers are for that that track record with crowdfunding? It's it's actually kind of sad. It's only about forty percent of projects that reach their goal. Um, so you set a goal. Um, hopefully, you've done a little bit of thinking. You've looked at the size of the audience you already have. You've looked at your complete budget, and you've decided you want to raise fifteen thousand, or twenty-five thousand, or fifty thousand. Um, but the current numbers are about forty percent of projects actually reach that goal. Um, most projects get something, um, get some portion. A lot get in the kind of sixty to seventy-five percent range of that goal, but reaching complete goals about forty percent. So maybe the best thing would be if the Royal Bank had a fund to give. 
to crowdsourcing, and then they would close, <laughs> and then we'd be able to get our financing where you would just get all the money back in fees. Okay. <laughs> no. that, is, that is the... Uh, the dream model. Yeah, the, that, would, that would be a dream model, you're right. Yeah. But um, I'm trying to think and go back here and where I where I was on the uh, just so a fully fully right access. fully fully funded. You approach a bank. You've got those contracts. You have a cash flow. You have a lock budget. Um, we would we would create our own cash burn scenario on one of our own spreadsheets that we do, and uh, look at the amount of money it would actually take through your production to finance it. We come up with the number and we use the tax credits that uh, that you have indicated you would receive on on the labor portion of your uh, your production and we give you the money now and uh, we wait for the tax credits to show up for a fee and for interest. for an enormous fee and interest <laughs> he's been he's been just waiting to unload you can tell Lawrence, are, are you passing the mic over? I'm thinking. You're, yeah. you're thinking that? Yeah. Okay. I'm and in the beaten up in a room. So. No, 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 no. <laughs> and in the far corner, weighing in at. <laughs> um, so my name is Avi Fettergreen. I'm a producer in Toronto. I have a company called Not Avi Fettergreen, but it's called Fettergreen Entertainment. Um, I produce probably two films a year. Um, and I opened in November my own distribution company called IndieCan Entertainment out of pure frustration by the lack of distribution of feature films in Canada. And I couldn't take it anymore, so I started my own company. I've released two films across the country, both to huge success, one of which is playing here tomorrow called Moonpoint, which we made. We, uh, it's, a, it's a great model to look at for future filmmaking. Or f future filmmaking. Because we, uh, Sean Cisterna, who's sitting right over there, came up to me at a screening of one week a bunch of years ago, and he said, I have a script I want you to read, and would you read? And I said, sure, and I read it, and I really liked it. I thought it was a really great idea. I felt it needed a little bit of work. I said, if you're willing to work with me on this, you and the writer, then let's, let's, let's do it. So we did, and we went after a bunch of development money, and we got turned on by everybody. And we kept trudging forward and developed it some more and more and more. And then we went back for some more development money and got turned down again. And we kept going. And then we decided, OK, well, let's go apply for production money. We got turned down by everybody. And we said, fuck it. We're going to make it anyways. And we did. We basically made the film for $75,000. Um, we made a really great little film. We showed it to a bunch of the distributors. They all said, we don't know how to distribute a $75,000 movie, no thank you. So uh, we went to t I went to Telefilm to see if there was any way we could get some marketing money or whatever from them. They said, no thank you. So I invested some of my own money and, and um, got some money from the Harold Greenberg Fund, like $5,000, and we released the film in Toronto um, at the Young and Dundas AMC Theater, and opening weekend finished six out of 19 screens there. We beat both Spielberg's Tintin and uh, War Horse. Um, that garnered us a second week, and then it garnered six other uh, cities to play the film. Um, TMN did not want the film in development, did not want the film in production, and I kept updating them on the successes that the film was having, both in festivals and, and, um, and uh, through theatrical, and basically convinced them to take the film. Not only did they take the film, but Air Canada took the film. And not only did Air Canada take the film, but the largest DVD distributor in North America, Anchor Bay, is releasing the film August 7th nationwide in every big box store you can find. This is all based on a film that everybody said was never going to happen. I'm here to tell you, it can always happen if that's what you want to do. And, um, you know, we funded this on credit cards and borrowed money from friends and family. We did a Indiegogo campaign and raised about $8,000. Um, and we had a group of people that believed in the film enough to donate their time to make the film. We made it in, 11, in basically 11 days, three weekends, basically, extended weekends, and then a couple of pickup days after that. Uh, we shot it on the Canon 7D, which everybody said was going to look like 
crap. And um, I blew the film up to a DCP and brought friends of mine who were well-established cinematographers in the industry who looked at the film and thought I shot it on either the Red or Alexa. Um, the cr total crew of the film was maybe 10 people. Um, and I, th I think that you know we have to look at alternative s ways of making movies today, the conventional ways of making films with 65 crew members and you know, big trucks and all this other stuff is not possible in the current model as it exists today. I'm here to tell you that. I've made movies I've, that have opened Toronto's International Film Festival at a $6 million budget level, which is going to be rare to see now. The funding is changing. The telephone model is changing. Um, chorus made for pay is gone for script writing. There's a very good chance Greenberg is going to be heavily affected this fall. If they go away, we'll, we got big problems. Um, so making films for a smaller amount of money is, in my belief, the way to go. Does it mean that you, making it for a small amount of money, you're making a bad film? I would say no. Um, a documentary that I'm distributing now called Peace Out, Charles basically made it on his credit card with him and his wife. Um, it's playing, it, I played it in five cities already in, the, in multiple days in, for theaters. It won the, um, uh, special Jury Prize at Hot Dogs for Best Canadian Feature Documentary and um, Super Channel is going to be releasing the film on pay TV in the fall. Um, Air Canada has also taken it and it's, they're going to play it. And This is a film that was made for peanuts and I really mean peanuts. Um, when you make a film you've got to look at all kinds of different models of, of, of why you want to get involved in a film. Is it commercial? Is it high concept? Do you know who your audience is? You have to ask these kinds of questions before you take on a project because it's like having a baby. You've got to live with it for the rest of your life. Um, and you have to find other ways of monetizing the film beyond just making the film. Like with Peace Out, I got Charles a book deal to release a, a, a book in conjunction with the movie, which the book will help sell the movie, the movie will help sell the book, and so on. With Moonpoint, um, Sean and I talked about what ways can we monetize the film. We, you know, we got 30 some odd artists that gave us a song for basically nothing. Some of the hottest indie artists in Canada, um, City and Color and a bunch of other people who, and we built a soundtrack and we sold the soundtrack. And the soundtrack, we used the soundtrack to market the movie and the movie to market the soundtrack. Everybody won. I think these are kinds of things that we have to start thinking about because the, the whole scenario of making films in this country is, and even internationally, is changing. 